Um, so if you looked at the agenda, you'd see that I guess I'm the optimist from the talk and Ryan is the pessimist to mine. Um, and you know, the truth is really somewhere in between. And so the answer to this question is in the middle, as you would expect. So the answer is maybe. Uh, but there are some advances that are um, pretty exciting, I think, from the nanopore that can help us. Um, so I guess this is probably not surprising to anyone in the audience, but the reference human genome is not actually finished. There is a large number of gaps. Uh, and most of the remaining gaps that are shown here in these large blue blocks um, are there because they're just very hard to sequence. They're heterochromatic. Um, particular chromosomes 13, 14, 15, uh, 21, and 22, those short arms, are the RDNA arrays. And there's two to 300 copies in every human in this room. Uh, and we don't really even have one good reference sequence. We have one, but it's actually wrong. Um, and we've been able to fix some of it. Uh, but you know, these are kind of the last intractable regions of the human genome that are left. Um, and they're very hard to sequence because they're long, they're repetitive, and they're not amenable to cloning or other traditional methods. Um, so this is kind of a history of where we've come from, from the early 2000s to now. Um, so this is the human genome as it stood when it was announced as finished in uh, around the early 2000s. Um, and so what this is showing you is every color change here is a context switch or an alignment error. So if you make a misassembly uh, versus the current reference, that would split. And so you want to have few color changes as possible. So these chromosomes over here, this is... It's hard to aim from here. This is pretty good. You know, most of this arm is in a single contig. This is not so good. There's maybe thousands of contigs on this. Um, and so the measure of continuity, the N50 of this assembly is about half a megabase pair. And this was, you know, uh, essentially a factory of sequencers, a room full of sequencers, millions in, of dollars, and a huge international effort. Um, fast forward about 15 years. Um, this is Clive's genome that he sequenced himself. This is an updated data set, including some of the grid ion runs he has done. Um, and here, the NG50 is now 30 megabase pairs. So we've gone from room full of sequencers and the huge international laboratory to one person doing their own library prep, maybe a tabletop of sequencers, um, and you can generate a, a better continuity than that huge international effort. And you can see that for some of these chromosomes, they're mostly in 10 contigs, 20 contigs. It's quite contiguous. Um, of course, this is not quite true, right? This is the because I know the human reference, I can tell you this one large contig is one arm of chromosome two, this other large contig is the other arm of chromosome two. If I sequence a completely new genome, I have no idea that those two contigs are related. What I'm really getting from the assembler is, say, about a thousand contigs, and I have no idea how they relate to each other. Right? Uh, also, another important thing is I don't know if there are any misassemblies here because I'm aligning to a reference. You know, there's on the order of 20 misassemblies in this genome. And so I can know that because I align to a reference. But if I'm doing a new genome, how do I know that there are these errors in here? And so one technology we've been looking at combining uh, is high c So this is a different data set. Uh, this is NA12878, a well-studied cell line. Um, this reason we use this is because it has good ground truth. It has a lot of different data sets available. Um, so there's nanopore data, there's Illumina data for validation, there's high c other data. And so this is if you take a the nanopore assembly that we published in this preprint uh, together with a large group, and then you add the high c data to scaffold. First, it fixes the misassemblies. Uh, and then what you see here is now these are showing scaffolds, not contigs. But the scaffolds are essentially at least chromosome arms or their full-length chromosomes. So now not only do I give you a bag of 1,000 contigs, I can now tell you, well, these five contigs are from chromosome 2. These six contigs are from chromosome 3. Um, and so this is kind of a blueprint that we're following to try to finish um, new genomes uh, besides the human reference. And Jay, who did this work primarily, has a poster number 15, uh, if you want to talk to him later. Um, one thing I want to also emphasize is in terms of consensus accuracy, um, using the long reads for also the polishing and improving the consensus with something like nanopolish is very important. Um, the reason is because if you try to map Illumina data to a genome with repeats in it, you are either going to map it equally well to all the repeat copies, or you're just not going to be able to map it at all because the cameras are too repetitive and you just don't seed with them. Um, and so what happens is when you give this to Pylon, it's going to say, well, there's too ambiguous. I don't know what to do with our DNA. And so we've done experiments where you take an assembly and you can run 500 rounds of Pylon, and essentially it hits a wall and never improves past this. And when you look, where are all the SNPs that are left over? Uh, and indels and errors, they're all concentrated in these RDNA arrays because these are about 7 KB. Uh, and so you can't uniquely map Illumina reads. And so therefore, there's nothing, no polishing software is going to do anything useful there. And so you're kind of stuck. 
Um, the long reads, you know, because they were long enough to span this and assemble this, they're also long enough to uniquely be anchored around each repeat and actually correctly polish the repeat copies. Um, and so this is why our kind of best current protocol is to use nanopolish to polish for the long data and then use Illumina data as the final step to improve some of the remaining errors because it's not perfect. Um, there's still some you know, errors remaining uh, because of methylation or other issues in the base calling that are not perfect from just nanopore data alone. Um, so the other thing we wanted to highlight that we used for this human genome were their ultra-long reads. Um, you saw Nick's talk this morning. He covered ultra-long reads. There's nothing much I can add. That they're awesome. Um, and certainly, if you give me one megabase reads to assemble, I'm happier than if you give me 100 base reads to assemble. Um, and this is primarily the work of uh, Nick and Josh in his lab. Um, and you know, what are these reads useful for in like a genome like humans? So great, we can assemble an E. coli with eight reads. What else can we do? Um, well, there are some very interesting applications. So this is the work of Karen Meager, who is also at this conference. So you can talk to her. Um, and you can actually see in the signal from the sequencer that you've reached the end of the chromosome, essentially. You've run off the end of the telomere. Uh, and because these reads are several hundred KB long, you actually can start before the large segmental duplications in the unique stretch of a chromosome. So you can assign a read and say, this is a read from chromosome 2, from the short arm or from the P arm or the Q arm. Um, and then you can see, go through the tandem duplications and see the actual length of the telomere sequence. And then you find a bunch of reads that are all from chromosome 2 Q arm, and then you say the chromosome 2 Q arm in this uh, genome, the telomere is X long. And so we were able to, this table shows the telomere lengths of some of the chromosomes that we were able to identify with these ultra long reads. And actually this also gives you a nice validation point, because if we do build these scaffolds, like I showed you with the high C data, and we claim this is a complete chromosome, then we should be able to find the reads that span the telomeres at the ends, and we should be able to confirm the telomere. And so we can validate whether we've misjoined across the telomere by finding these telomere signatures, and we can also validate that we've accurately captured the end in the end cap of the telomere, which is what you would expect if you are completing the genome. Um, the other nice thing is uh, you can assemble very complex regions very contiguously. So this is the uh, major histocompatibility complex. Um, it's about a four megabase region. It's one of the most complex in the human genome. Uh, it's a small part of the 16 meg context, so it assembled that plus more from this chromosome. Um, and you have all the genes represented there in a single contig. Now the trick here is, and this comes back to a problem with essentially all reference genomes, is all humans are diploid. Um, but the reference is a single sequence. And so when we produce an assembly here, this is one contig, but the genome has two copies of all most of these genes, and they're not the same. And so what the colored bars here show is that really the assembly doesn't really represent any version very well at all. Um, so every color is essentially saying that one haplotype disagrees with your consensus. And so there's regions where we're essentially switching between the two. And so if you look at this and you say, really, this doesn't represent any human uh, that's valid, right? And so um, originally what we did for this paper is we did a manual approach. Uh, we used Illumina data to call SNPs. We combined it with nanopore data to do phasing, and then we assembled out individual uh, contexts for just the MHC region, and that was very manual. Uh, we've now been working on an algorithm that's part of the assembly process that essentially gives you two copies of all your, uh, of your genomes. So you essentially get about a five and a half gig genome, a little shorter, uh, before polishing. Once you run nanopolish, that increases um, from your assembly, so you essentially get the diploid architecture of the genome. Uh, and when you look at these haplotypes, they still have all the genes. They're a little bit less contiguous because um, you don't have as much coverage for the full data set if you now think of the genome as being twice the size you're used to thinking of it. Um, but you can actually have um, correct phasing and you have about almost 98.5% correctly phased SNPs across the entire genome. So you have the whole genome correctly phased that is accurately representing the diploid genome that you actually are trying to sequence. Um, so with that, um, I'll end. Um, so, you know, closed human genome, uh, kind of, I've given you a blueprint for how we can move towards that. Um, the current human reference contig NG50 is about 56 megabase pairs. Um, with the Cliveome data, uh, with recent PEG bio data sets, you can get over 25 megabase contigs, uh, 30 megabase contigs. We've predicted, uh, based on modeling of the repeat content in the human genome from what we know in the reference, um, that if you got 30-fold uh, of these ultra-long reads, you should be able to get a 50 megabase contig size, which is approaching that of the current reference. So this de novo, we could reconstruct this reference, which has had years of manual effort. Um, 
if we get better at resolving re at repeat resolution, we can even get that to closer to 70 by our modeling. Um, and so then we can combine these kinds of, we can now reach into these things that are intractable, like the centromeres, the telomeres, with these ultra-long reads, uh, as well as the RDNA arrays. We can use other technologies like HiC to scaffold them, assigned to chromosomes, uh, and then use these ultra-long reads to validate that we've captured the centromeres and the telomeres, as well as try to reconstruct the actual diploid genome. So that's our goal going forward, is that we want to actually reconstruct a diploid genome accurately. So with that, um, I'll take any questions, and thank you for your attention. So we have, a little, uh, we have a little bit of time for a couple of questions. We just uh, ask you to please wait till the mic reaches you so everyone can hear the question. Um, so what kind of co uh, haplotyping coverage are you getting? So how, mu how much of that assembly can you haplotype? So that full assembly was at less than 40x. So, um, or what do you mean haplotype coverage of the genome? Yeah. Or, uh, or how, much so of the, how much of the assembly can you haplotype? Uh, it's about 90 some percent. So the majority, both, uh, both of the haplotypes are about okay. 2.8 gig of the assembly size. Another question is, um, when you incorporate high C data, mm -hmm. do you plan on incorporating haplotyping into the high C scaffolding also? Yeah, that's the, okay. the plan because okay. the high C, we actually also use the high C to validate on, on the, another project where we don't have, so for NA12878, we have gold standard platinum genome haplotyping we can use for validation. On other projects where we're doing this, we don't. And so we're actually using the high c as validation to make sure what we have phased is correct. Uh, and then we're also using high c that's specific to a haplotype to maintain that phase. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. This might be a trivial question. I'm just curious, how, how long is ultra long? How long is ultra long? For the reads, um, so it's the same definition. Um, this is the same data set that Nick was describing. So N50 is over 100 KB. Max read is about um, one megabase pair. So, so you have to get to that to be useful, right, in, in your? Um, no, I mean, so um, we've done, if you look at the preprint for this human genome where all this data is described, uh, we did a repeat modeling to look at how long reads have to be in different read length distributions to resolve different repeats in the human genome. Um, and so, you know, most of the human genome repeats are actually um, like lines that are 7KB or ALUs, right? ALUs are probably the most common, and those are very short. Um, and so you can get very contiguous assembly. The reason you're getting these megabase contigs is because you're resolving mm, a large fraction of lines. Um, and so you get very contiguous, but then there are certainly these large uh, remaining intractable repeats that you need to get to to get to 100 plus KB reads to resolve, like the telomeres and other things like that. I think to keep time, we'll take one more question, and then uh, if there are any additional questions, we'll do it during the open panel session. So you were talking about uh, telomeres. Um, as as you know, telomeres get shorter with age. So it, it seems like it depends very much on what the source of the DNA was, how long those. Will be. Are you seeing a lot of variation in within the sample, or is it pretty consistent for uh, say chromosome? There's, they're X? relatively consistent in the cell line, but this is a cell line that's been passage for a while, so I don't know how indicative a cell line is of a uh, actual human, right? Because it's not reproducing the same way, um, and it's not aging the same way, obviously. So um, it's not really. Uh, I don't think these results are really valid for inferring anything about humans. Um, but it is uh, interesting that we can actually start looking at it, and it is pretty consistent in this cell line, but. Um, that's not necessarily true if you actually looked at a real human. All right. Well, thanks again, Sergey, for a great talk. Thank you.